Hello everyone, uh, welcome to lecture one of our course Communication Networks for Power Systems. Uh, this is a first of a series of two lectures in which we talk about fundamentals of communication networks. So we'll go through some uh, terms and expressions that we will be using throughout the rest of the semester. First, what is a communication network? A communication network is a network that allows for transmission of data between two devices. Within the communication network terminology, we use the term device, endpoint, host, user, or end system interchangeably. All of them mean the same thing. We often picture a communication network as a graph. In this graph, each of the devices would be a node. And these nodes are connected to one another through edges. So this would be your node. This would be your edge or link. A node is a device that can send data, can receive data, can forward data. Sometimes it can store data or process data locally. And the links represent communication interconnections between these different nodes. Um, every link can be a wired one or a wireless one, and it has a maximum capacity, which is often indicated in terms of the bit rate, which is the number of bits per second that can be transmitted throughout that link. Next, we have circuit and channel. Circuit, also known as a path or a line, is a physical communication path that connects a source node to a sync node or a transmitter to a receiver. Consider this example. You have two devices that wish to communicate with one another. This communication is done through a circuit as shown here, which consists of a switch, multiple routers, another switch and a firewall, and of course, the physical links that connect these devices to one another. Now, channel is a logical counterpart of a physical circuit. When we don't really care about the details of a circuit connecting to devices, we show that interconnection using a channel, which is an arrow like this. And this simply indicates that these two devices are connected and can transmit information. In some resources, you might um, hear the word trunk. Uh, trunk is basically the same as a circuit, except that it's a circuit that is shared between multiple users. A very important aspect of a circuit is the direction in which it can transmit data. Based on the direction of data transmission, a circuit can be simplex, half duplex, or full duplex. Simplex is a circuit that allows for one-way communication. For example, consider you have two devices that wish to communicate with one another. You have a sender and a receiver. A simplex circuit allows for data transmission only from the sender to the receiver. We also have the half duplex circuit. This is a two-way circuit, so you can transmit data in both ways, however, only one way at a time. So if the receiver wishes to send something to the sender, it would have to wait for the communication from the sender to end to then send its data. Um, a good example of half duplex uh, circuits is a walkie-talkie. Two people can communicate through a walkie-talkie, but one at a time. Then we have the full duplex circuits. This is a circuit in which we can have two-way communication at the same time. So both parties can transmit data at the same time and simultaneously. A very good example of this is your cell phones. When you're talking to someone, although it wouldn't make sense to talk at the same time, but if you wanted to, you could. That's because each of you, you and the person you're talking to, would be using a different frequency range. So both, both of you can send your data without interfering with the other person. Another important aspect of circuits is the way they allocate resources. In terms of resource allocation, we have two categories for circuits. Circuits can be either dedicated or switched. A dedicated circuit is a circuit that directly connects two devices and no other device is allowed to use that circuit. So if you have two different devices that wish to communicate, you have one physical circuit connecting the two, which is solely dedicated for the transmission between these two guys. As you can imagine, this is quite resource intensive. Um, and as a result, it's really reserved for situations where you have two devices that are continuously communicating with one another. 
Otherwise, if you have intermittent communication between devices, it wouldn't be cost effective to allocate a dedicated circuit between the two. The opposite philosophy of this is switch circuits. Here, the connection between devices is made through intermediate switching devices. Now, switch circuits can operate based on circuit switching or packet switching. Let's consider this diagram at the top. When you're making a phone call to someone using a landline, when you dial the number, the switching office determines the location of the destination party. And essentially, the cascade of different switching offices make that physical connection between your phone and the phone of the person you're trying to reach. Here, you have established a circuit that will be reserved for you for the duration of your conversation. Now, opposite of this is packet switching. In packet switching, you don't allocate resources beforehand. Instead, you break the data that is supposed to be transmitted from one host to another host into multiple pieces. These are known as packets, uh, but we're not going to get into details right now. That term packet has a very specific meaning that we're going to come back to later on when we discuss the network layer. For now, just consider packet to be bits and pieces of information. This original data um, is broken into packets and every packet is going to be routed from the source to the destination independently, meaning that there is no guarantee that the packets will follow the same route. Consider the previous example again. Your voice data will always go through this path to the destination. However, in the bottom diagram, you can see that your original data is broken into multiple packets and each packet is going to be routed differently. So one will likely go through this line, another might go through a different line and another yet a different line and so on. In packet switching, um, it's likely that all the packets will follow the same route, but that only happens when the network is not congested. When the network is congested, it's possible that once you start sending the packets, some of the routes that you used before are not available to you anymore. So you would have to find an alternate route for the rest of the packets, which is why each one might be uh, transmitted to the destination through a different route. Now in this activity, I would like you to compare circuit switching with packet switching in terms of these categories, robustness, available bandwidth, possible congestion, potential bandwidth waste, and cost. What I would ask you to do is to pause the video at this point, think about this activity, and when you're ready to move on, press play. Okay, let's revisit what we talked about. In circuit switching, you have two hosts that will communicate through a circuit that is dedicated to them for the duration of communication. This is circuit switching. In packet switching, on the other hand, there is no dedicated circuit. In fact, every packet of information might go through a different route. So this is packet switching. So let's consider these categories. Which one is better in terms of robustness? Take a look at circuit switching. If one of the intermediate switching devices here fails, the entire circuit will fail. In the previous example, your phone call will be dropped and you're gonna have to call again. Packet switching, on the other hand, if one of the intermediate switches here fail, only the packet that is going through that route will be lost. The rest of the packets will be routed through different paths. So in terms of robustness, packet switching would be superior. How about available bandwidth? Well, in packet switching, you are sharing the available bandwidth with everybody else. If there are multiple users that try to transmit information, their packets will be sharing the path with you. On uh, the other hand, for circuit switching, the circuit is reserved for you for the duration of your communication. So in circuit switching, you have more bandwidth available, so it would be superior. Possible congestion kind of follows the same logic. Uh, in circuit switching, this is your circuit to use, so it will not experience any congestion from other devices that are trying to communicate. However, in packet switching, again, your not reserving any resources and you're using the resources just like everybody else. So if many, many users are trying to send information at the same time, you're likely to have congestion. So in terms of not having congestion, circuit switching would be superior. 
What about potential waste of bandwidth? Well, in circuit switching, the circuit is yours, whether you want to use it or not. You can call your friend. Um, the physical circuit is reserved for you, but you can just stay silent. Um, you are, in fact, not using the bandwidth efficiently because you're not transmitting any data, but the bandwidth is reserved for you. On the other hand, in packet switching, if you don't use the bandwidth, somebody else will. So in terms of potentially wasting bandwidth, packet switching is superior because you have less waste of bandwidth. How about cost? Well, circuit switching provides a lot of bandwidth for you and no congestion. That's at the expense of being more costly. Because now, imagine if you wanted to have multiple pairs of devices, you would have to allocate these resources to each pair that wishes to communicate. And this is going to be much costlier than uh, packet switching, which no resources are reserved beforehand. So packet switching is going to be less expensive. All right, let's move on with our basic definitions. A communication network consists of two subnetworks, the core and the access network. Now, the core network, think of it as a mesh of switches and links that provide connectivity for across the entire network. So you will have these switches and they are interconnected to one another, creating the core the backbone of this communication network. Then you will have individual devices that wish to communicate with one another. Their communication would have to be um, through this core network. And as a result, they would have to connect to that core network. The network that connects each of these users, each of these endpoints or hosts or devices to the core network is known as the access network. And the first device within the core network that the user would have to connect to, this is known as the edge router. Now, routers are very specific devices that are used in the network layer. Um, we're not going to talk about them right now, uh, but we'll come back to this in great detail when we start discussing um, network layer. Um, this network that connects this access network that connects the user or the endpoint to the core network is also known as the last mile. Last mile basically indicates the last leg of communication between the user and the edge router um, and is the link that delivers and provides service to the customer and reaches the customer premises. Some of the examples for the last mile are, for instance, the copper wire that connects a house to the end office or the coax cable that connects a house to the utility cable box. Or for example, the cell towers that connect cell phones to the backbone of the cellular network. Take a look at this example here. Um, this is an interconnected network. The green lines represent the core network, which I'm showing here. As you can see, each one has an edge router. For example, let me use a different color here. This guy is an edge router, this guy is an edge router, and likewise, this guy and this guy. And then you have the access networks. These access networks that I'm showing with blue lines are the networks that connect the customer premises to the core network. We have different networks in this example. One of them is a home network that consists of a desktop and a laptop. Um, you can have enterprise networks consisting of multiple desktop computers and servers, or even a mobile network, a multitude of devices that are connected to the core network through uh, the wireless base station. Now, there are two very important characteristics associated with the type of transmission services that you provide. One of them is related to the type of connection. The other one is related to the level of reliability. Let's talk about connection first. Data transmission services can be either connection oriented or connection less. Connection oriented means that the resources are reserved for the duration of communication between the two hosts. If you recall from our discussion a few minutes ago, a circuit switching approach would actually be a connection oriented approach because you have resources that are reserved 
for duration of the time that the two devices wish to transmit data. Here, data is transmitted along the same path. So if you have device one and device two, this resource is reserved for them and all the packets of information will go through the same path. This provides the highest level of reliability because you're not affected by congestion that much. You will have more bandwidth available and the data packets are received at the destination here at the receiving point with the same order that they are transmitted from the sending point. Um, there is less likelihood of having missed packets. There is less likelihood of having duplicate packets. And again, these are notions that we're going to come back to later on. But for now, um, remember that it provides a higher level of service. Opposite of this is connectionless. Here, no resources are reserved and the data is transmitted along any path that is available. This again is the example of packet switching that we talked about. This is also known as the best efforts approach because you're not providing any guarantees about anything. Um, essentially, the communication network will try its best to transmit the data correctly and in the right order from the sender to the receiver. This might make you wonder that why do we use this? Um, the main reason, cost. In this approach, which is connectionless, um, you can set up a communication network in a much more inexpensive way compared to the connection oriented approach. So for applications where um, highest level of quality of service are not of utmost importance, connectionless approaches would be quite sufficient. Now we have something in between, which is a virtual connection. Um, this, unlike connection oriented, this does not reserve any resources for you. But unlike connectionless approaches, it does provide some guarantees. So while resources are not reserved, you will get some guarantees about, for example, how much bandwidth is available to you, what is the expected delay, what is the percentage of packets that might be lost, and things like that. The second aspect of data transmission services is reliability. Now, there is an important point here. Reliability within the context of communication engineering is different from the notion of reliability that we know of in engineering fields. In the field of engineering, whenever we talk about reliability, we're often referring to the notion of availability. A device is reliable if it's available and operational at a particular point in time. This is not the notion we mean when we talk about reliability in communication. In communication, being reliable or unreliable has to do with whether or not you send an acknowledgement. So in a reliable transmission service, when the sender sends a packet to the receiver, the moment the receiver receives that packet, it'll send an acknowledgement that, hey, I received this packet. Unreliable services, on the other hand, they don't have acknowledgements. So the sender basically sends these packets and there is no acknowledgement coming from the receiver. So when we talk about reliable versus unreliable, again, I emphasize what we're referring to is whether or not you're sending acknowledgements. Now in this activity, what I would like you to do is to think about these types of applications that I have listed here. Um, and for each one, uh, decide what type of connection and what level of reliability you would want. Again, um, I would ask that you pause the video at this point, think about this, and when you're ready to move on, uh, press play. Okay, let's start with the first one, file download, movie download. When you're downloading a file or a movie, what's important to you is that all the packets of information are sent in order, none of them are lost, and none of them are duplicates. As a result, you would like to have a connection-oriented approach. Also, it would be great if whenever the receiver receives a packet, acknowledges to the sender that it has received it so that the sender does not have to resend it. So for these two reasons, for file download and movie download, we often go with reliable connection-oriented transmission services. How about junk mail or database queries? Here, the needs of reliability and quality of service are much lower. 
um, if the uh, signal, if the message, if the data doesn't go through, that's not the end of the world. In junk mail, you, um, the sender might, might send hundreds or thousands of messages to different users, and it doesn't really want to receive any acknowledgements because it could you know, uh, make its network crowded. For database queries, likewise, you are sending a query to a database. If it doesn't go through, you just send it again. So this is the lowest quality of service that we're, we're happy with, which would be unreliable connectionless. What about text messaging? In text messaging, you definitely want to know if the message has been received, so it has to be reliable. However, it can be connectionless because the size of the message is typically small, and even if it doesn't go through, you can send it again. Uh, so this is typically done through reliable connectionless. And lastly, voice over IP would be an example of unreliable connection oriented. Why connection oriented? because voice over IP packets are voice packets. These voice packets, you want them to be received at the destination in the right order. Otherwise, the sentences would not make sense. However, asking for acknowledgement would make the network congested and crowded, and it's not, not really necessary. Imagine you're talking to someone over the phone. Um, if they don't hear you, they will ask you to, to repeat. Um, and this way you can implement it using an unreliable but connection-oriented network. Now, network models uh, can be classified in three categories. These can be client-server, publisher-subscriber, or peer-to-peer. Client-server models are used in situations where you have a server and a client that request certain information or data from the server. Every time you're uh, trying to you know, go to a website, essentially you're the client who is connected to the server of that website. Um, this is used a lot in engineering applications. Uh, for example, a controller uh, might ask for information from a particular system, or for instance, a system might ask for information from a particular sensor. Then we have publisher-subscriber models. Um, these are also known as producer-consumer. Here, the idea is that you have multiple devices. All of them are subscribed to certain service provided um, by another device. So when this new device has data to share, it will share it with everyone. This way, as you can imagine, you need multicast or broadcast capability. Then we have peer-to-peer -peer models. In peer-to-peer -peer models, um, this is like a client server in which every device can be both a server and a client. So it's not like client server where the client would have to ask information from the server and the server would provide the data. Here, each entity can be both a client asking for information or a server providing information. Now think about example applications that use client-server or peer-to-peer -peer models. Again, pause the video, think about it, and then hit play. Now, there are so many examples for these. Uh, for client-server applications, email application is an example of client-server. Uh, when you do network printing, essentially you're uh, connected to your uh, network printer through a client-server model. Uh, when you're surfing the web, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you would be uh, connecting to the, to the website server, which would then provide the information, the HTML information that is contained in that website. Uh, for peer-to-peer -peer also, there are so many different examples. File sharing is one. When two computers uh, connect to one another to share files, that would be an example of peer-to-peer -peer model. Um, another example is distributed voice over IP or messaging. I emphasize on the fact that this is distributed because there are some voice over IP or messaging services in which all the messages or voice data are being transmitted to a server first, and then the server, the centralized server, will send it to the destination. Um, opposite of this, in distributed voice over IP or messaging services, you would be directly connected to the destination and the messages will be uh, sent and received directly without the need for an intermediate server. Now, in terms of transmission technology, links can be broadcast or point-to-point. -point. 
Broadcast links are links that are shared between multiple entities. And any information that is shared across this link is going to be received by everyone that belongs to that link. Uh, it can have two subcategories of broadcasting when the message is sent to everyone or multicasting when the message is sent to a subset of users or devices that have subscribed to that particular service. This is similar to the publisher subscriber model that we just talked about. Opposite of this is point to point links. These are links that connect individual devices and they use unicasting, meaning that you have one sender and one receiver. This is the approach that is used both in peer-to-peer -peer as well as client-server models. Now, there is an important note here to be made. Uh, be very careful about the um, acronym P2P because P2P can mean point-to-point -point or peer-to-peer. -peer. And as I just mentioned, point-to-point -point can be either peer-to-peer -peer or client-server. So if you read P2P in a document or if someone talks about a P2P connection, make sure that you clarify whether they are referring to point-to-point -point links or peer-to-peer -peer communication. Similar to the previous example, uh, I would like you to think about example applications that use broadcast, multicast, and unicast methods of data transmission. Uh, please uh, pause the video, think about this, and press play when you're ready to proceed. Uh, there are quite a few examples for each category. For broadcasting, you can think of TV broadcast, radio broadcast, or live streaming. Uh, for multicasting, some examples are teleconferencing or video conferencing when you have a subset of users that will receive the data. Uh, or mass emails for people who are subscribed to a particular email list. And um, there are so many examples for unicasting, uh, voice over IP, checking your emails, checking the website, all of these would be examples of unicasting. Now, the network can be configured in different ways. We have so many different topologies. Each one would be appropriate for certain types of applications. Uh, the easiest of all would be a direct connection between a, a pair of devices. You can have a multi-drop type configuration when you have one, for example, server that is serving multiple clients. You can have a daisy chain or linear configuration where all these devices are connected to one another, however, not directly. So if A wants to communicate to B, the communication would have to go through C and D. Um, if you close this loop, you will have the ring configuration which again, uh, devices are connected to one another. Unlike the daisy chain approach, here connection would be through two different directions. And then for more highly connected networks, we can have fully connected or mesh networks that are typically used for situations and applications where you need a higher level of reliability. And when I refer to reliability in this context, what I mean is engineering reliability, in other words, availability. All right, let's move on to a different concept now, the notion of decibel. Decibel is a very important concept that is used in um, control engineering and communication engineering a lot. In communication engineering, we use decibel for two main purposes. One of them to indicate the power level of a particular signal. The other one is to quantify the amount of gain or loss in a signal, also known as amplification and attenuation. Let's start with the first one, signal power. You can indicate the power level of a signal when compared with a particular reference signal using decibel, which is 10 times log of P, the signal of interest, divided by P ref. As you can imagine, because you're dividing powers by powers, this would be a dimensionless measure. Um, but the, the fact that we use the log scale allows us to go with like very, very large numbers all the way to very, very small numbers. Now, what we typically do is sometimes we wish to um, indicate the absolute level of a signal power, in which case we use a standard reference. This standard reference, the PREF here, can be either one watt or one milliwatt. Um, and the decibel value corresponding to each one is known as decibel W for watts or dBm for milliwatt. 
So P in dBm is 10 log of power value in milliwatts divided by 1 milliwatt, and P in dBw is 10 times log of power value in watts divided by 1 watt. The second application of decibel is to indicate the gain and loss in a system. Here again, you can look at the ratio of two signals in the form of 10 log of P2 over P1. And oftentimes what you're interested in is an output signal to an input signal to see, for example, how much of a signal loss you have through a particular medium or how much an amplifier is amplifying the input signal. Um, now, when we look at it in terms of output signal to input signal, we often show this as G to indicate the gain of a particular system. Um, in looking at the gain of systems, um, sometimes we are more comfortable dealing with voltage magnitudes as opposed to powers. So instead of looking at the output power to input power ratio, we want to look at the output voltage to input voltage ratio. Here, um, you know that power is V squared divided by R. So gain is 10 log of P out to P in, which is going to be 10 log of, you have V out squared divided by R divided by V in squared divided by R, and the R's cancel out, you're left with V out squared divided by V in squared. This you can write it as V out divided by V in squared, and log of something squared is two times log of the original uh, component. So that would be two times 10 log of V out to V in, which is 20 log of V out over V in. Those of you who are familiar with Bode plots in control systems, you remember we often use the 20 log as opposed to 10 log because we're dealing with voltages. Now, there are some interesting numbers here that is beneficial to remember. Um, imagine you have a system that amplifies the input signal by a factor of 2. So P out to P in would be 2. The gain for this system is 10 log of 2, which is 3 decibels. If you have a system that attenuates the signal uh, by a factor of 2, in other words, amplifies it by a factor of 1 half, you will have 10 log of 1 half, which is minus 3 dB. So a 3 dB in gain means the signal is doubled in magnitude, and a negative 3 dB in gain or 3 dB in attenuation in loss, that means the signal magnitude is halved. Other useful ratios is uh, 1 dB is associated with an amplification of 1.25, and 2 dB um, with amplification of 1.6. One thing you notice here is Every time the decibel value of gain is positive, that indicates amplification, and negative values indicate attenuation. So don't judge the amplification or attenuation level by the magnitude alone. The sign is quite important. Positive is amplification, negative is attenuation. Another benefit of decibel here is that, as you remember from calculus, uh, log function allows you to convert multiplication into addition. So here, if you have multiple systems that are cascaded, instead of having to multiply all those gains by one another, what you can do is you can calculate the decibel value gain of each one and just add the decibel values uh, together. All right, let's uh, go through an example here. So we have a communication network that introduces 13 decibel of amplification. What I would like you to do is to find the power level of the received signal uh, with respect to the transmitted signal. So we know the gain in decibel, which is 13 dB. What I would like you to, to find out is the actual gain in absolute value. Again, uh, pause the video, work through this, and when you're ready, hit play. Okay, now if you... Um, have a calculator ready, finding this is going to be quite simple. Um, you basically say 10 log of P out to P in equals 13. So P out divided by P in is going to be 10 to the power of 13 divided by 10, 10 to the power of 1.3, which is almost 20. 
What if you don't have access to your calculator? In fact, most communication engineers, when they want to calculate this, they break it into the useful numbers that I showed you on the previous slide. So for 13, I can write it as 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3, four times, plus 1. Now, one gain of 3 dB doubles the magnitude. Another gain doubles it again. Another double, another double, and then you will have 1.25. If you find the multiplication of these, it would be 20. Similar question as before, except that here we're dealing with attenuation um, as opposed to amplification. So we have negative 20 dB amplification or attenuation of 20 dB. And I, I'd like you to calculate the same thing as before. All right, assuming you um, did this, you, you see that uh, finding it using a calculator again is quite simple. What if you didn't have a calculator? Here, what I can do is I can say negative 20 dB is minus three, minus three, essentially six times minus two. One minus three halves the magnitude. The other one likewise, so this happens six times. And then for that last negative 2 dB, you have 1 over 1.6. So this will be 1 half to the power of 6 times 1.6, which is around 0 0.01. Now pay attention uh, that negative 20 dB attenuation indicates a 99% attenuation, right? This is important because since we are using the log scale, even a um, reasonably small number still indicate can indicate a significant, significant loss or significant gain. In the previous example, we had 13 dB, which meant the signal is amplified 20 fold, which is huge. And here we have negative 20 dB, which means that 99% of the signal is lost. So pay attention that because we're using log scale, the numbers uh, do not really uh, direct linearly as you would intuitively expect. Now, in addition to looking at the input signal versus the output signal, we're also interested in signal to noise ratio. Uh, noise is something which is always present in communication systems. Uh, sometimes it comes from the background or sometimes it's generated by other devices that are um, operating, for example, radio transmitters or electronic devices. Now, we're often interested in knowing what is the magnitude of the signal of interest to the noise which is unwanted. So we look at it as signal to noise ratio, S over N, which is the power of signal divided by power of noise. We can use the decibel value, essentially look at the decibel value of signal to noise ratio as 10 times log of P of signal to P of noise. Um, another factor that we sometimes look at uh, is the noise factor or the noise ratio, which is signal to noise ratio at the input of the system to the signal to noise ratio at the output of the system. If you look at it from absolute values, it would be a ratio. If you look at it in terms of decimal values, uh, because log uh, converts division to subtraction, this will be signal to noise ratio of input minus signal to noise ratio of the output. The last thing that we'll talk about today is the freeze formula. Uh, this is used when you have a cascade of series devices and you want to know how the total noise factor will shape up to be at the output of the system. Uh, consider this hypothetical example when we have a three-stage amplifier. You have a source that has an input signal and input noise. It's amplified through an amplifier with a gain of G1. The amplifier, we're assuming that it's non-ideal, so it's introducing its own noise. And then the resultant will go to the second amplifier, which is going to amplify everything, signal and noise included, by a factor of G2, and then introducing its own noise. And likewise, the same thing happens at the third stage. And uh, at the end, you will have the output signal and the output noise. The output signal is basically the input signal 
multiplied or amplified by G1, G2, G3 in this example. What about the output noise? Output noise, take a look at this equation, is related to input noise, this guy, which is amplified through G1, G2, and G3, G1, G2, G3, plus this guy, N1, which is only amplified through G2 and G3 because it is introduced by G1, so N1, G2, G3, and then you have lastly, uh, actually not lastly, you have N2, which is amplified by G3, this term, and now lastly, N3, which is directly going to be introduced in the output. Now, by dividing these values, you can find the noise factor of the entire system. Um, so we're going to stop here for today. Uh, this is a list of references that uh, I used throughout these uh, slides. If you need more information about any of the topics that we talked about, I encourage you um, to um, consult these references.